So you're there in Isaiah chapter 5, and we are continuing our study through the book of Isaiah. And uh, as you know, um, Isaiah is kind of like the mini Bible. There are 66 chapters, and then there's 66 books in the Bible. And uh, so this would be, if you were falling in line, obviously this would be Deuteronomy. So um, I'm going to show you some correlations there. And as we go through this, I do kind of want to point out some different correlations, how that would correlate with those books. Um, I think that's interesting. Um, but this, this does kind of, uh, th this finishes off from chapter 2. If, if you remember, chapter 2 is where we have an introduction of, of Isaiah having a vision that the Lord is, is showing him. And that vision is all the way into the end of this chapter. Okay, so... Um, so really from chapter 2 on to chapter 5, we're dealing with the same vision, but obviously different aspects of what's going on. Um, but the thing that I see here, if I was going to put a title on this, um, is dealing with the, the vineyard of the Lord. The vineyard of the Lord. So that's what we see first of all here. So I want to read from verse 1 there, uh, down talking about the, the, the vineyard of the Lord. It says in verse 1, Now will I sing to my beloved a song of my beloved, touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered out stones thereof and planted with the choicest vine and built a, a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth, wild grapes. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. So at the very first here, when you're looking at from verse 1 to verse 6 there, He's talking about this vineyard, okay? And at this point, you don't really know exactly maybe what he's talking about. But in verse 7 there, he's going to clarify who he's talking about, okay? So he's not just talking about some vineyard where there's actual grapes. He's using that as an illustration uh, of, as far as dealing with Israel. We'll see in verse 7 here. It says, and it says, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, and behold, oppression, for righteousness, but behold, a cry. So, when he's talking about this vineyard, he's talking about the children of Israel. He's talking about that nation of Israel. And he's not just talking about the northern kingdom. So, if you remember in the timeline here, we're dealing with Uzziah and then Jotham as king. Because in chapter 6 here, uh, it, the next chapter is going to be in the year that Uzziah the king died. So, um, we know that we're around that time as far as uh, Uzziah and Jotham, his son, reigning with him. And, uh, and so that being said, we know that the children of Israel are still there because it's not until Hezekiah's reign that Israel is completely taken out and that northern kingdom is completely taken captive. So we know that nation's there, but he's talking basically about it as a whole. And what's interesting is that uh, Jesus brings up a parable about a vineyard. And it's actually pointed at Israel. So go to Matthew chapter 21. And so, again, when you're looking at Isaiah, you're going to see the immediate future, right? The immediate future as far as we know that Israel is going to be completely taken out, right? It's going to be, they're going to be taken captive and decimated. But then also we know that Judah will eventually be taken out by the Babylonians, okay? And Judah was then going to come back. You know, as far as that nation is going to come back after 70 years of captivity. And we know, we already know that story, right? So you can kind of see where he's coming from as far as how they're going to be taken out and that nation is going to be, uh, you know, judged and all that. So you can see that immediate future, but this fits lock and step with the judgment that came on uh, the nation of Judea or Israel back in Jesus' day, okay? And so Jesus is giving a parable here. Kind of like Isaiah is giving a parable, uh, but notice who it's pointed to. Now, in uh, Matthew 21, verse 33, so Matthew 21, verse 33, it says, Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about, and digged a wine press in it, and built a tower, and let it out to husbandmen, and went into a far country. Sound familiar? Because you have this fact that he has 
uh, a wine press. It's talking about grapes, the vineyard, all that stuff that's being said here, right? Verse 34, and when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his, his, his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did, did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. And so, so who do you think this is talking about? Okay. Now, it's funny because Baptists today can't figure this out of who it's talking about, okay? Be, it, but the Pharisees, I'm going to show you the Pharisees even knew who he was talking about here. He's talking about Israel. He's talking about that physical nation of Israel at that time when he's there. And, he, and basically saying that this has been going on for a while, meaning that he'd send them prophets and they would stone some, they'd kill others. But then he said, but last of all, he sent unto him his son. Okay, who do you think he's talking about? Obviously, he's talking about Jesus. He's talking about how he came unto his own, and his own received him not. And if you don't believe me that this is talking about the Jews back then, this is talking about, obviously, how the Old Testament is going to be completely demolished, and, you know, that covenant with that nation is no more. Notice what it says in verse 40. It says, When the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? They say unto him, He will miserably destroy destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus saith unto them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whomsoever or whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard the, his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. And when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. Okay, so they wanted to take him out, but obviously the people, he knew the people wouldn't let that happen. They were afraid of the people, but they, are, they knew who he was talking about. He was talking about them. Okay, and this is, this is what Isaiah 5 is really talking about here, is the fact that that nation is going to be taken away from that physical nation of Israel, that covenant that he made with Israel, uh, you know, when he, when he met with them on Mount Sinai, but in Exodus chapter 19, it, you know, it was that conditional covenant he made with that nation of Israel, saying, if you keep my commandments, then you will be a peculiar treasure, then you'll be a holy nation, and what is going on here is that they broke the covenant. And if you remember in, in Hebrews chapter 8, Hebrews chapter 10, it says that, that they broke the covenant. It's because they found fault with them. That's why God didn't regard the covenant. Okay? And so it's not that God broke his covenant. It's the fact that they broke it. Okay? So if you have an agreement with somebody, you know, when it comes to a contract, right? Say you buy a car or whatever. You have a contract to say, hey, I, this car's mine as long as I pay the payments, okay? Well, if you break your contract by not paying the payments, guess what? You don't have the car anymore, right? So it's a breaching contract. Now, thank the Lord, salvation's not that way. It's an unconditional contract, meaning he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. There's no, there's no you know, you can't take that away. You know, if he says you have everlasting life, you have everlasting life. But the Old Testament was not that. It says, if thou shalt keep my commandments. Salvation is not if thou shalt keep my commandments. It's if thou believest on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. Now, uh, that being said, there's other verses on this. Go to Luke chapter 13. Because if you remember, it said that the men of Judah, were, were that, that was his pleasant plant. right? So he had the vineyard. But Judah particularly was the one that we, we know, obviously, the Bible talks about how, uh, you know, he's the, the line of the tribe of Judah. And so Judah is where the Lord sprang, you know, the high priest that sprang out of the tribe of Judah. Um, and obviously through David and that lineage there. Um, but in Luke chapter 13, what's interesting, actually in, in Matthew, and I know we already went through the book of Matthew before we went through Acts, 
So if you remember, we have already hit a lot of these parables with the fig tree, with the vineyards and all this, um, and how he was, pic- it was obviously picturing the people of that time that uh, was rejecting him. But in Luke chapter 13, we see this, this parable that he gives about this fig tree that's being planted. And it says in verse 6 here, it says, He spake also this parable, a certain man had a fig tree, or I'm sorry, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came and sought fruit thereon, and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Okay? So, it's interesting because if you think about Jesus' ministry, how long was he in, a min- in his ministry for? Around three years, right? Maybe not exactly. We don't really know exactly when he started. We know that he died on the Passover. We know that much. But we don't know exactly when he started. But we do know this, that, that three Passovers took place, you know, since he started his ministry, okay? Now, that's if you're reading the King James, you read the other versions, they actually take out the one in John where it says that the Passover was nigh. And they say, well, that's not really in there. So they'll say, well, he was only 32. So he, he began his ministry when he's about 30 years old. That's what it says in Luke chapter 3. And there's three Passovers that took place since then. So let's assume that it's a little more than three years because a Passover took place after he started his ministry. Um, but that, that being said, it's around three years, right? And so it's interesting that he's like, three years, three years I've been looking for fruit on this tree, and I find none. And notice that the person's saying, oh, let it alone this year also, meaning like, let's just let it continue out the rest of this year, right? Do you know what the Passover represents besides the fact, obviously, it's, it's a feast they represent, but, uh, but it's the beginning of the year, Amen. right? April, well, April, Abib, not April, <laughs> but... Uh, April, Abib was to be the first day of the year for them, right? That's what marked the first day of the year. Well, you know, that's when they would uh, basically, that's how they knew when to keep the Passover. On the 10th day, they'd get the lamb, and then on the 4th day, they'd kill it. There's a whole process that's in that. But all that to say is that um, it's interesting that this parable is talking about, you know, three years of, like, not finding fruit on this thing. And he's saying, hey, you know, let's give it, let's give it to the, last, the rest of this year, you know? <laughs> And we'll dig about it, we'll dung it. What is it talking about? Fertilizing it, okay? See, guess what? They knew about fertilization back then, too. They weren't dumb, you know, like everybody wants to think that they were just like, they didn't know anything about sanitation or anything like that. Um, But (coughs) go to Matthew chapter 21, because there's another instance, and this isn't a parable. This is just straight up what Jesus did. Now, if you think about how he told that parable, actually before this event, you can understand you know, what he's trying to picture here, okay? So imagine that you're Jesus' disciples, and he said this parable to you at some point back in the, you know, whenever he said that in in Luke chapter 13, that, you know, this parable about this fig tree that wasn't bringing forth fruit, and he gave it three years, and basically just being long-suffering with it before they cut it down, right? Well, in Matthew 21, verse 18, it says, Now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever, and presently the tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Make a little more sense now? You know, when you think about the fact that in Matthew 21, he's getting ready to go to the cross. I mean, he's at the end of his ministry here in Matthew 21. Okay, and so, uh, so, so that being said, you can understand, you can say, why is he so harsh on that fig tree, <laughs> right? Um, but it's not that he didn't give it any time and that he wasn't long-suffering with it. And if you remember in, uh, in Isaiah chapter 5, dealing with that vineyard, he's asking Judah, you know, basically to judge between him and the vineyard, okay? And... Notice in verse 4 there. So in verse 3 it says, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard than, than that I have not done in it? And think about that. Jesus went about doing good, doing these miracles, 
And isn't that the question you would ask yourself? Like, what could he have done that he didn't do to save that vineyard, right? And, and I mean, obviously, the answer is nothing more. I mean, if Jesus is the greatest soul winner to ever walk on the face of the earth. He's God in the flesh. I mean, no one can, I mean, if you think you could do better than what Jesus did, you'd be like, well, I could have won them. <laughs> you're you're foolish. I mean, you're, there's no way that you could do as good as God himself. And so, that being said, this makes a lot of sense. He's saying, you know, it's not like he didn't try. It's not that he didn't care about his vineyard. He sent them prophets day in, day out, you know, and they would just kill the prophets. They'd stone them. I mean, the long-suffering of God, you'll see that throughout the Old Testament, where he just keeps trying to get them back. He's long-suffering, and he'll completely destroy them, and then he's like, all right, you know, and he'll bring them back. And it's just this back and forth where he's punishing them, but he loves them, wants them to come back into the fold and trying to work with them, right? And, uh, but this is the final straw, okay? Because, you remember at the end of Matthew uh, 22 there, or 21, which we read, is the fact that it says that, he, you know, the kingdom of God is taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. That's where he's cursing the fig tree and it's withering away and it's not going to bear fruit again forever. And notice that it says how soon is the fig tree uh, withered away. And you think about the Old Testament, right? When Jesus died on the cross, that's when the Old Testament stopped. That's when the veil rent from the top to the bottom, when Jesus died, when he gave up the ghost, right? And it says that the New Testament doesn't have power until the death of the testator. So, simultaneously, the Old Testament stopped, New Testament started the moment Jesus died, Amen. okay? That being said, uh, the, the Old Testament was still there, if you will, meaning that people were still practicing it. But when did that temple get destroyed? You know, let's say Jesus died. Let's say that the calendar's correct and Jesus was born on 0 AD, right? And uh, he died at 33 AD. Then 70 AD is when the temple was completely destroyed, right? So you're dealing with 37 years and it's completely gone. There's no more sacrifices have been, been done since then. So how soon it's withered away. You kind of see that, right? Because it says he hath made the first old. Now that which... Uh, waxeth old, or decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away, it says. Talking about the, the old covenant to new covenant, it says in Hebrews chapter 8. And so it's waxing old, it's ready to vanish away because when Hebrews was written, you know, it was, they were still doing sacrifices. We went through the book of Acts, right, and they were still doing that stuff. And even New Testament believers were still getting sucked into doing the Old Testament sacrifices and all that. But eventually it's completely withered away, it's completely waxed old. And I believe this falls lock and step with that. Um, Matthew 23, if, you know, going into the fact that you know, he sent into his vineyard um, prophets, in Matthew 23 and verse uh, 37, it says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, now that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Okay, and in, in, the, in the next chapter, in Matthew 24, he's talking about the temple, and it says, Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left one, here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So he's pronouncing judgment, saying, Hey, your house is left unto you desolate, the fig tree's withered away, the kingdom of God is taken away from you and, bring, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And, you know, how much more could he say that, Hey, this is done, you're done. You know, the, the, the Old Testament's done. You as being a nation of the physical nation of God is over. And you say, well, what does that mean? Well, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It's not that his vineyard's gone. It's that he let it out to other husbandmen. Amen. Right? Isn't that what it says in there? He says, you know, he's going to destroy those husbandmen, and he's going to let it out to other husbandmen. He's not taking away the kingdom of God completely. He's taking away the kingdom of God from them and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. What do you have? Well, he made this covenant with this physical nation of Israel so that they'd be the light unto the world. They'd have the oracles of God. They'd be you know, preaching the gospel from the rooftops and they'd be the watchmen to the world. They failed at that. They broke his covenant and he, and he broke, and so he broke off with them and says, I'm, bring, I'm giving it to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Someone that's actually going to bring forth fruits with the gospel. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6 here, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6, it says, I have planted, Apollos watered, 
but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry. Amen. Ye are God's building. Okay? And if you think about it, what is he saying to the Jews? He's like, your vineyard is taken away. Your, your tree is completely withered away. Your house is left unto you desolate. But what's he saying to the saved? He's saying, well, no, we're the husbandry. We're God's building. Okay? And to further uh, bolster that, go to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. And we're going to get the rest of the Isaiah 5 here, but really this is kind of the big thing. When I, when I think of Isaiah 5, I think of the vineyard of the Lord. Okay? And I uh, just got, want to nail this down that in the New Testament, what you have is the middle wall of partition is broken down between Jew and Gentile. Okay? Meaning we are all fellow citizens of the saints. We are all citizens of the commonwealth of Israel because we are the Israel God by faith. Meaning that uh, now, as the holy nation, we are the holy nation to bring forth fruits unto God, okay, as the believers, whether Jew or Gentile. So there's no difference now, you know. So it, it's basically just opened the door to something that's a lot more effective and it's going to work a lot better. So now it's not just coming out from Jerusalem, it's coming out from every local church that's in the world, okay. Now in 1 uh, Peter chapter 2 and verse 6 there, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 6 it says, Wherefore also... It is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. So kind of get the similar case where it's talking about the, the kingdom of God is being taken away from you, given to the nation, bringing forth their fruits thereof. And have you not read in the scriptures uh, the, the stone which the builders rejected is made the head of the corner and basically on whomsoever this stone shall fall, grind him the powder and all that stuff as far as the, the chief cornerstone, which is Jesus Christ. But notice in verse 9 there, it says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so just if, if you think, well, maybe he's just talking about scattered Jews that are, that are around. Well, notice what it says in verse 10, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Okay, so it's very clear that you're not talking, this is quoted in, in Hosea when it's talking about the Gentiles, okay? that, that uh, those that were not God's people were now called the children of the living God. And, and you say, well, you know, maybe he's talking about, well, why is he saying at the very beginning of the book, it says to the strangers which are scattered abroad, and, and it talks about to those that are in Asia, Bithynia, you know, Galatia, Cappadocia, right? It's obviously not talking about uh, Israelites, okay? And so that being said, you know, uh, we are the chosen people. We are the royal priesthood as believers, whether Jew or Gentile. So if a Jew believes, guess what? He's that, of that, that holy nation. Guess what? Paul was, Peter was, all the apostles, all those that were Jews were all of that holy nation that he's talking about there. And now we're in the New Testament, and obviously it's a lot better. It's called the Better Testament for a reason. Okay, There's a lot of things that are better about it. But this chapter in Isaiah chapter 5 is showing us the lens to the future as far as the fact that, hey, you know, that vineyard's going to, your vineyard's going to be taken away, okay? That hedge is going to be taken out, and, you know, he's going to let down the hedge, and, you know, you think about the fact that, um, you know, even in all those, those, those parables about the vineyard in the New Testament, he says that he hedged about it, you know, he's protecting it, and in, in Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 30, it says, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me in the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Okay. And obviously he's talking to someone that's in captivity because Judah is in ca Babylonian captivity at that time. And so um, God is basically saying, I'm taking away the hedge. And what happened when he took away that hedge? Rome came in and completely destroyed Jerusalem, Amen. took out the temple, took out everything. Okay. And so, uh, but I want to move on from that. So that's the vineyard of the Lord. By the way, you know, when you think about that, at the beginning here, it talks about this song. I will sing a song of my beloved in his vineyard. We don't sing Lily of the Valley here, 
Okay, this is a side note, but in Song of Solomon, when it says, I am the rose of Sharon, I'm the lily of the valley, that's the woman talking, okay? And so, if you read Song of Solomon, she's constantly talking about her vineyard and, and talking about herself, okay? And talking about his vineyard, meaning talking about her, okay? And when it's talking about the man, it's talking about him being this, this apple tree, <laughs> you know? But the lily of the valley, we don't sing that song because... That's not talking about Jesus, so it's kind of weird. Like it says, He is the lily of the valley, the rose of Sharon, and um, it's just not biblical. But I've heard people go to this passage and say, See, and I, I don't see it here either. So I don't really get where they get that from. But, um, but Isaiah 5 and verse 8 here, notice what it says here. So he's pronouncing this judgment against Israel, saying, Hey, listen, that vineyard's going to be, it's going to be taken out. And it says, verse 8 here, it says, Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place, that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. In mine ears, said the Lord of hosts, of a truth, many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair, without inhabitant. Yea, ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and the seed of an homer shall yield an ephah. Now, I didn't look up these measurements, but I'm going to take a gander here that this is a shortage, <laughs> okay? So, um, but yeah, I mean, I know it's a shortage because you're talking about 10 acres and just one bath, it's not that much, okay? So it's basically talking about the fact that basically all your labor is gonna be for naught, you know? It, it's kind of like where it talks about in Haggai where you're putting all this money into your pockets with holes in them. So you're just basically, you know, you're, you're working all this labor, you got all this money, but it's just basically burning through your, your, your pockets, right? Um, but this kind of makes me think of a passage because you can kind of speculate what it means to join house to house. And you can think, well, maybe it's talking about, you know, big cities and the babbles of this world and everybody wants to be all together and, and join together. Um, but I think of these verses. Go to Proverbs chapter 11. As, as far as joining house to house, I think of these verses in Proverbs where it's talking about though hand join in hand. You know, join. It, it, this makes me think of this because we're obviously talking about a woe pronounced on people that do this. And what I believe is that people are joining together in this wickedness, right? They're kind of coming together, and it's not just someone's doing wickedly. They're just like, let's all come together and do wickedly, okay? Um, so, in, uh, so I'm not saying it's, it's wrong to join hands, right, in this passage. So I don't think it's necessarily wrong that house is joining house, but what are they doing by joining house, right? They're, they're coming together to what it says later on, to draw on iniquity with a cord, you know, and as a, a cart rope. They're trying to just pull it into each other, and they're joining up and linking up to do iniquity. And uh, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 21, it says, Though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished, but the seed of the righteous shall be delivered. So when it's talking about hand joining with hand, it's talking about basically wicked people coming together, and they're coming together because they think that in a, in a crowd of people, they have safety, right? It's kind of like, well, we're all in this together. We're all doing this. You know, we can't all be destroyed. There's so many of us. But, you know, it's always this case. There's always going to be more wicked people than righteous people. And what it's saying here is though, though they're many and though they're joining in hand, you know, and you think of like all the perverts out in the world that join hand in hand and their, their queer pride parades, and they're trying to basically get all together, and all, all, you know, all the Hollywood elites are trying to join hand in hand and trying to come together. You know, you can join hands all you want, but you're still going to be punished, Amen. right? It's not, it's not going to change the fact that you're going to be punished. But God will deliver the righteous no matter how few they are. Actually, God likes delivering few numbers. Amen. And if you ever read through the Old Testament as far as Gideon, and you think of all the different small numbers he used to do great things of God or to deliver people, out of uh, great numbers. And, uh, and we went through the kings, if you remember, all those cases where the, the, the kings of Judah that trusted in the Lord Amen. and how he delivered them out of these great multitudes. Uh, but Proverbs chapter 16, kind of the same thing. Proverbs 16 and verse 4. Proverbs 16 and verse 4. So I'm not getting too deep into what does all this mean. Um, it's really just showing you that, hey, they're all kind of coming together to do wickedness, but it's, it's going to come to naught. That's what it really comes down to, is that God's not going to bless that. They are going to be judged. And though there be many, and though they're holding on to each other and trying to uh, be a pack together, it's not going to help them. Proverbs 16, verse 4, it says, The Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. Every one that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. Okay? 
So that's what I see going on here, is basically they're trying to join hand in hand to do evil, and, and God's just, he's saying it, it's not going to help you. It's not going to help that you're, you're trying to join up to do this. Uh, go back to Isaiah chapter 5, Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 11. So, you know, we saw with the vineyard that they, he didn't find the grapes that he's looking for. He found wild grapes. And in, in the New Testament, we see that they, he, didn't, he couldn't find fruit on the tree. And this makes me think of Jude, where it talks about these trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. And that's what you're dealing with. And he says later on, he's going to be talking about how, hey, listen, it's going to, it's going to bear thorns and briars. And anytime you're dealing with thorns and briars, you're dealing with a curse. Whether you're dealing with people being thorns and briars and being cursed, children, or you're just dealing with the land being cursed, right? And, uh, and so that's what we see here is that he's basically saying, listen, you're going to be, you're going to be judged. Your land's going to be destroyed. It's all going to be cursed because you didn't uh, follow his commandments. And it's getting into the reasons why. Notice in verse 11 here, it says, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink that continue until night, till wine inflame them. And the harp and the vial and the tabret and pipe and wine are in their feast, but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. So we're getting into the root of the matter a little bit here. What's going on? They are increased with goods, and they have enough time to just drink and be merry. And basically all this is getting into is the fact that they have, you know, they're a prosperous society. And down in verse 22, it, it kind of goes back into it a little bit. Verse 22, it says, Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine, and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward, and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. You know, the Bible talks about in Proverbs, Wine is a marker, and strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. You know, it, it, it is, it's very foolish to drink wine, strong drink, and, you know, it may start out as a sip, it may start out as just a social thing, but it'll turn into you being a drunkard. It'll turn into ruining your life. And here, it's, it, you know, people that will always want to justify drinking, show me a passage in the Bible where people are actually, uh, where God's, you know, praising somebody because they drink. And don't you dare go to Proverbs 31 when you're talking about giving drink unto those that are, that are ready to perish or those that are of sorrow of heart. Because I wouldn't call that a praise, okay? That's not my text verse for what I want to do for the Lord, is being sorrowful of heart and ready to perish. And so that being said, I preached a whole sermon on drinking, but really, do you see how this has affected that nation when it comes to drinking? He wanted fruit from them. He wanted grapes, right? And they brought forward wild grapes, and not only that, but they were drinking this alcoholic wine, and it was obviously causing them to give poor judgment. They were, they were justifying the wicked, and they were taking away the righteousness of the righteous. So, you know, perverse judgment was going about. But go to Isaiah 20, 28. Isaiah 28 touches on this as well. And we live in a society where drinking is the norm. You know, it's something that is not frowned upon. Actually, if you don't drink, people look at you like you're, you're crazy. You know, you go to like a company outing or you're somewhere and they're like, they actually get mad at you if you don't drink. And you're like, no, I don't drink. And then they're just like, they're like, why don't you drink? You know, it's like, well, I don't. So you don't want to like come. I'm not that person that's like, listen, the Bible says wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging. Who's ever deceived thereby is not wise. Why are you drinking? You know, I don't want to come down on people like that, you know. And now, now it does come down to, I mean, if people are being belligerent about it, be like, listen, drinking will mess up your life. And the Bible's against it. And if you want to really know why I don't drink, it's because of that right there. You know, I don't need it. And, uh, but, but people are usually doing that because they know that that's not what they should be doing. So when you don't drink in front of them and you're saying, I don't drink, you know what that tells them is that you're saying you're better than me. <laughs> you know, that's what they think in their mind. You're like, are you telling me you're better than me? I mean, <laughs> you know, and, and it, anyway, all that to say is that people are always getting offended because you don't drink in our society. In Isaiah 28 and verse 7 here, and by the way, you know, with all this stuff going on, this is not a time to get into the bottle. It's never a time to get into a bottle. But anytime you have 
you know, depression or anxiety or stuff like that, if there was ever a time not to drink, that's the time not to drink, okay? Because all you're doing is taking that and, and being dependent on that to get you through it, to numb your pain for a little bit. And it's like any other drug, you start getting on a drug, and then, you, then at that point you're just addicted to it, okay? You know how you don't become an alcoholic? Don't drink one, one sip. I mean, it's hard to be an alcoholic if you never drank it at all. It's hard to be a smoker if you never smoke one cigarette. It's hard to be a drug addict if you never tried any of it, okay? And I know, you know, in, in, a, in a group, you know, in our church, I'm sure people have drank. I'm sure people have smoked. I'm sure, you know, like all these different things. Um, and, and don't raise your hand or tell me, like, what you've done or haven't done. But at the same time, you would probably even stand up and testify and say, yeah, don't even try it. You know, why would you try something and be like, well, I just want to see what it's like. What if you like it? Now you're in trouble. So you want to stay away from this. But in, in Isaiah chapter 28, I believe this is what it's talking about, particularly with the drinking. It says in verse 7, it says, But they also have erred through wine, and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness, so that there is no place clean. Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. Now, the reason I want you to see that last portion there is because, again, a lot of this is showing us when Jesus is going gonna, is gonna to come on the scene, and who did he reveal all this to? Babes. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings. Amen. That was perfected praise. And he even says, O oh, Holy Father, I'm glad that you've, you've uh, hidden this from the wise and the prudent and revealed it on the babes, okay? And when it comes to this, I think about, you know, you ever hear that old phrase, you know, like, it's kind of like when they, when, they, uh, when they voted in, like, Obama or even Trump, you know, for that matter. You're like, go home, America, you're drunk. You know, you ever hear that phrase, you know? It's kind of like that when you think of, like, what he's saying here is that, you know, you guys are drunk. You can't, like, tell people, like, the difference between what's left and right. You know, it, it, it's... it's it's impairing your judgment, okay? And so we need to stay away from all alcohol. Um, and so, and listen, if you, if, you, if you say, well, can I take NyQuil? That's not what we're talking about, okay? You're not going to get sloshed off NyQuil, okay? Plus, you'll probably throw up before you ever got to that point <laughs> as far as that goes. So, uh, but what we're talking about is obviously drunkenness is, is wrong, okay? That's, that's where church discipline would take place, okay? If you're an alcoholic, if you're a drunkard. Okay, um, but the thing is, is that you need to stay away from that stuff. So I'm not here to police your life, you know, and all this other, you know, things as far as what you do at home. But if it's evident that, that you're a drunkard, then that's where church discipline comes into in the place. Um, so, but how much more if I was drinking? What would you think if you saw me out just drinking a beer? You say, well, that's, that never happened. Happens in Baptist churches all the time. They call them beer churches. You know, they call them, you know, like the, the Reformed Baptists. They're constantly trying to justify drinking because they want to drink. And, you know, what would you think if I was just like, yeah, I'm just going to put, you know, a beer up here as I'm preaching? You'd think it was crazy. Like, how are you going to preach us doctrine? How are you going to, you know, be sober, as the Bible says over and over again, when you have alcohol sitting there as you're preaching the sermon? And I want to ask these Reformed Baptists, will you do that while you're preaching? Well, I mean, if drinking's not wrong, then put it right there in front of your pulpit as you're, as you're preaching to them. Amen. You know, I challenge them to do that, but obviously they're not going to do that. So, but the thing is, is that what it, what it states here in, in Isaiah chapter 5 is that because these people are impaired and they're, they're not teaching doctrine, they're not giving the people knowledge. Okay, and we see this, this epidemic today where people don't know the Bible at all. I mean, most of the time why people are angry at you for being a Christian is because they don't know the Bible, right? They're saying, well, isn't all sin equal? It's not what the Bible teaches. Shouldn't we love everybody? Not what the Bible teaches. Amen. Isn't everybody going to heaven? You know, like people say that stuff and they'll say, well, that's what the Bible teaches, isn't it? You know, Jesus never got mad at anybody. Uh, I think I remember him making a, a cord of small, you know, a, a, you know, he made a cord, you know, and then basically just a whip or whatever. Now I'm, now I'm messing it up because it's a whip or of small cords. Anyway, 
he literally turned over tables and started beating people out of his temple. Okay? He wasn't angry. Read Matthew 23. When he just goes on this tour de force on the scribes and the Pharisees and the hypocrites and just leans into them. Amen. And by the way, tell me God's not angry. I mean, what are we reading right now? God is angry with the wicked every day, and that hasn't changed. Amen. Okay? But people have this, they, they've made up their own God in their mind. And what it comes down to is that they just lack knowledge. And I, I, I believe most people in the world are just ignorant. Okay? So we need to be gentle, you know, instructing those that oppose themselves. Meaning that if someone comes at you with that, you know, give them a Bible verse and just say, well, what, do you, what about that? And some people, if they just see it, I think they'll understand, hey, okay, maybe I just haven't read the Bible. Maybe I just haven't really realized what's in there. Uh, but notice in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 13, notice what it says. Therefore... So what, what's the therefore? It's, it's, it's basically what it's there for. So meaning that they went after strong drink, they went after wine. It says, and therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. And their honorable men are famished and their multitude dried up with thirst. Therefore, hell hath enlarged herself and opened, up, and opened her mouth with, without measure. And their glory and their multitude and their pomp, and he that rejoices shall descend into it. And the mean man shall be brought down, and the mighty man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God that is, that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. Then shall the lambs feed after their manner, and the waste places of the fat ones shall strangers eat. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity, and sin as it were with a cart rope, that say... Let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come that we may know it. So he's, he's stating here that, hey, because you go after strong drink and wine and all this, my people don't have any knowledge. You're not teaching them any wisdom. Okay? And today, especially in churches uh, in a lot of Baptist churches, because I'm just kind of, I'm picking on the Baptist church because there's actually legitimate churches. Okay? And, uh, and I've been in churches where it's just the gospel message every single Sunday, you know. And it's just the same thing over and over and over again. And this, listen, there's other stuff in the Bible. There's a lot of doctrine. There's a lot of things in life we need to know. And people are being destroyed for lack of knowledge. Now, obviously, you can put that on the realm of soul winning and evangelizing, right? Because people are going to hell. Hell hath enlarged herself, meaning that because you don't show people the knowledge of salvation... That's why hell, you know, people are going to hell, or you know, more people are going to hell than if you would have given them the gospel, okay? So I believe there's a lot of things that are going on with Israel here. First of all, they're not preaching the gospel like they should be. Does that mean no one's getting saved? Well, of course people are getting saved, because the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. That's an unbroken chain. So people are getting saved. There's always been people preaching the gospel. There always will be people preaching the gospel. But when it says hell hath enlarged herself, you know what that means is the job's not getting done, right? That fruit is not coming to fruition. Actually, that's probably not the way you should say it, right? <laughs> but basically, it's not being productive. They're not actually doing what they should be doing because hell is winning, right? The gates of hell are winning. But remember, Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So the idea is, is that when we're out soul winning and you're doing what you should be doing, Hell isn't going to enlarge yourself. Those gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. And so, uh, you know, something to think about with that. But go to um, uh, Hosea chapter 4, uh, because a similar language is used there, dealing with the lack of knowledge. And I see that, I see that in the realm of soul winning, you know, when it comes to uh, preaching the gospel to every creature and how uh, Christians are dropping the ball on that, by and large. Um, and... We need to obviously always be cognizant of our soul winning program and winning people to Christ and, uh, and never think that we're doing enough, okay? And I know this past year, I mean, this, this year has been a really good year for soul winning as far as just the numbers. I mean, we've been winning a lot of people to Christ week in, week out. I know it's been a little more sparse, you know, these past couple of weeks because of everything that's going on. Um, but all that to say is that I personally believe that it's going to get even better after this. Because I think that when you have people that are worried about economic downturn, you have people that are thinking about death, that actually it's going to be even better after this. 
And so we need to be ready to just, just hit the ground running, go out soul winning, be soul winning right now, you know, with the people that you can talk to. And uh, in Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, it says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. As they were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore will I change their glory into shame. And this is the, the, the danger of being increased. There, listen, it's not wrong to be rich, but it's wrong to trust in your riches. And it's, it's not wrong to have money, but it's wrong to love money. Okay? And this is the danger of increasing in riches. That's why in Proverbs chapter 10 it says, Give me neither riches nor poverty. Right? I don't want, I don't want to be poor. You know, I don't want to be so poor that I'm going to have to like steal and profane your name. But I also don't want to have so many riches to where I'll forget your name. To where I'm so increased that I won't be trusting in God and then I'll just forget about your commandments. And that's what our country has turned into. Our country has become so fat and sassy that, you know, the things of God have gone out the window. It's all about all the entertainment, all the, the you know, I love the fact that all the sports are down. Amen. Okay. And I know my brother, my younger brother is all about March Madness and we lift together in the morning, not right now because all the gyms are closed, but, uh, but he was literally really sad about it. I'm like, I'm like, I don't care. I don't care at all. But uh, back in the day, I probably cared a little, I cared a little more. I went to WVU and all that. But, but you know what? This is a good thing. If you think about it, with all the, the sports being down, all the entertainment, you know what it shows you is that that stuff's not essential. Amen. That's all extra. Okay. Do I think it's a sin to watch sports? No, I'm not saying that. Okay. <laughs> It's not a sin as long as you're not making it an idol in your life to where you're, you don't go to church or you don't do things of God. But is it really necessary? You know, I think this is really showing people what's necessary. And, uh, and the Bible also says, you know, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, that there is going to come a time, and I believe in a lot of generations, not just the end times, but there's just a lot of generations where they will not endure sound doctrine. Okay. And the Bible says, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And that's where the fun centers come in, okay? Where, you know, the chestnut ridges and all these other places where people are just wanting to have their, their ear scratched, right? Be like, you're doing a good job, and... And just come in here, have a good Holy Spirit experience. And, and it's, there's no doctrine, though. They're not learning anything. It's all just nonsense that's being said up there. And most of the time, it's, not even, it's, it's against the Bible. But here's the thing. Even if the person up there in these fun centers aren't saying anything bad, it's what they're not saying that's bad. Because there's a ton of stuff in the Bible. You're supposed to preach the, the whole counsel of God. Preach the word in season, out of season. That's the whole word of God. And, uh, and that's what we're dealing with today. And again... You know, this is why hell is enlarging herself. You, you want to say, you, why are there so many earthquakes? Maybe hell is enlarging herself. You know, I mean, I'm not a seismologist or, you know, uh, I don't know what you would call a volcano person. But, uh, but anyway, all that to say is that I'm not, I'm not that. I'm a structural engineer. But I do understand, you know, seismic forces and all that stuff. But I'll say this is that there has been a lot of tsunamis. There's been a lot of earthquakes. Actually, there was an earthquake just this, uh, this past week in, in America, right? That uh, I think it was at Utah or something like that. Um, and so um, and I'm not saying it's the end times, like earthquakes in diverse places. But what I'm saying is that, um, but what do you think causes those earthquakes? Probably hell enlarging yourself. I mean, if you think about like how there's going to be volcanoes erupting and all this stuff in the end times. And it's just a thought process there. But... To go with the fact that, hey, Isaiah chapter 5 is, uh, is linked to Deuteronomy. When is the first place that hell is mentioned? Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 22, or 32, 22, it says, For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. So the first time hell is mentioned is in Deuteronomy. Where's the first time hell's mentioned in Isaiah? Chapter 5. So I linked in my you know, correlation as far as the 66 books, 66 chapters there. I mean, there's, I'm sure there's a, a lot of correlations you could find, but 
Um, but that's interesting to me is that hell is mentioned the first time in Deuteronomy, first time in Isaiah. And it's mentioned other times in Isaiah, obviously. Um, but going to Isaiah chapter 5 there in verse 20, it says this. It says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, and that put darkness for light and light for darkness, and put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. You know what this makes me think of is the twilight zone. Do you ever just like look at things that are going on in the world and you're like, am I in the twilight zone? Is Rod Serling going to come out and start smoking a cigarette and tell me that I've just entered the twilight zone? When they say that there's like 52 genders or I don't even know how many. I'm probably going to, people are getting triggered because I don't know how many genders there supposedly are. But you, you see the stuff that's going on and you're like, this can't be real, right? This can't be reality that people are trying to shove down my throat. And uh, that's what you see today. You see righteous people being called evil, right? People that preach the Bible and preach what God says, they're evil, they're hateful. But the sodomite that sends that same person messages about how they want to kill and rape their family, that's not evil. That's righteous, right? We want to protect that, okay? But that's what the world wants you to think, okay? And, and here's the thing. This has been going on. There's nothing new under the sun, Okay? But when you have generations, you have generations that are really bad about it, and then it gets better, and then really bad about it, and then it gets better. But you know what causes it to get better? God's judgment. Amen. You know, hard times will create good people. Think about the Great Depression, the greatest generation, right? We call it the greatest generation, which is our grandparents. Well, depending on who you are. My grandparents, uh, you know, uh, what would be called the greatest generation, you know, World War II, all that. But you had the Great Depression, hard times where people were literally trying to live off just minimal stuff and everything that was going on in that time. Well, they carried that over in their life. What happened? Prosperity. Prosperity. And then what do you get? De the degenerate society that you get. So, you know, when you think about the times that we're living in with, you know, the viruses and all this stuff, and I'm not here to say, like, I'm happy all these people are dead or I'm happy this happened or whatever. All I'm saying is let the, Lord, the, uh, the will of the Lord be done, okay? Amen. And, you know, if God allows it to happen or if he brings down our economy to where, listen, we're brought down a peg to where people will start being a little more humble and people have to live a little less so that they're not so proud and, and like, against God, you know, maybe that's a good thing. Okay? Actually, I know that's a good thing. I know even on our level as Christians, maybe we need to be brought down a peg as far as all the things that we have that are not needed. Okay? And you know what? You know, so be it. You know what? When you have nothing, you have nothing to lose. The more you have, the more riches you have, the, the riches will cause you not to sleep. The, the, the sleep of a laboring man is sweet. But when you have everything in the world and you're afraid, well, what if they take all my stuff? What if you take all this? What if you don't have anything? Take it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know, if you have food and raiment, then we should be content. Amen. And uh, the last thing, you know, the last bit of the chapter here in Isaiah 5 is really just kind of showing the judgment of God. Um, so I don't want to get real too deep into it. But notice what it says here. We'll just read this here in verse 24. It says, Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble, and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness, and their blossom shall go up as dust. Because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts, and despised the word of the, uh, of the Holy One of Israel, therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled against the, his people, and he has stretched forth his hand against them, and has smitten them. And the hills did tremble, and their carcasses were torn in the midst of the streets. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. And I know, I know, uh, uh, Miss Paula, you brought this up to me one time when we were talking about this, about what this means. Because a lot of times in Isaiah, you'll see that, you know, he's made bare his arm, and his, his arm, his right hand has brought salvation. This is not talking about bringing salvation. When you look at the very beginning of that verse, it's talking about, and he has stretched forth his hand against them, okay? And then it says, for all his, this, his anger is not turned away, okay? So this is not like saying, all right, I poured out my anger, but my arm stretched out, you know, come back to the fold, you know? No, he's basically saying, for all this, he's not done, okay? Now, if you look at the rest of this chapter here, this is very similar to what happens when the sixth, or I'm sorry, the, the, the fifth trumpet sounds in Revelation, and uh, so when you read here, it keeps talking about the lions and these horses, okay? Like roaring like a lion and the horses that are, 
uh, going forth here. Verse 26, it says, and he, he will lift up the ensign to the nations from far, and will hiss unto them from the end of the earth, and behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. None shall be weary nor stumble among them. None shall slumber nor sleep. Neither shall the girdle of their loins be loosed, nor the latchet of his shoes broken. Whose arrows are sharp and all their bows bent, their horses' hooves shall be counted like flint and their wheels like a whirlwind. Their roaring shall be like a lion. They shall roar like young lions. Yea, they shall roar and lay hold of the prey and shall carry it away safe and none shall deliver it. And in that day they shall roar against them like the roaring of the sea. And if one look unto the land, behold darkness and sorrow and the light is darkened in the heavens thereof. Now, I don't want to read this whole passage in Revelation 9 because I'm ending it right here. But, uh, but in Revelation chapter 9, there's an army of 200,000,000, 000, which is 200 million, that's unleashed on the world, and, it's, and they're, they're there to kill men, okay? And it talks about these horses having the head of a lion. So 200 million horses and, you know, men on horses, and the horses had the head of a lion, and it talks about their tails having the tails of a, of a serpent that have uh, heads on them. So it talks about how to, to hurt, hurt men, okay? And so they, they are given to, to kill a part of the earth, a third part of the earth, okay? And so I believe there's a, a strong correlation there because he keeps talking about them roaring as lions, okay? And you can definitely talk about that being his bravery, right? Because it talks about uh, David and his men had the face of lions. So you can talk about, you know, just the fierceness of that army, okay? But I, listen, Revelation, I know there's a lot, of, a lot of symbolism. I believe there's going to be horses with heads of lion that are literally breathing fire. That's what it says. Okay. I don't believe that's symbolistic. I believe that's literally what's going to happen. I believe there's going to be locusts that are coming out of hell that are going to look exactly like what it describes there. Okay. And so that's a scary thought. Now, praise God, we're not going to be here for that. So you know, that's when God's pouring out his wrath on this earth. Okay. But that's quite a judgment there when it comes to what's going to happen in Revelation. And obviously in Isaiah chapter 5, there's the near future application as far as uh, Israel being taken out by the Assyrians, but also uh, Judah being taken out by the Babylonians, okay? And obviously those are both fierce armies that take them out. Um, but, uh, but Isaiah chapter 5, the vineyard of the Lord, and uh, just a, a lot of information there as far as what would cause that vineyard to become wicked. And, and really it's from within, okay? They destroy themselves from within. There was a hedge there. Okay? It's not like outside forces could have taken them out. They destroy themselves from within. And so we need to be thinking that as a church as far as the fact that, hey, listen, all the darts from the wicked and all that, you know, if God be for us, who can be against us? But we can destroy ourselves. Okay? And that's why we always need to keep ourselves in check um, because you know, God can take away that candlestick. And so, but, uh, but Isaiah chapter 5, Hopefully that was a blessing to you as far as just the information there. I know there's, there's a lot more that I'm sure we can get into with that. But let's end with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. And just pray that you'd be with us throughout the rest of this week. I do pray that you'd be with those of our church that can't be here in person. And also that you'd be with those that aren't feeling well. And Lord, just pray that you bless them. And I do pray that you'd be with us through this time. Uh, and just help us to serve you in every capacity that we can. And Lord, we love you and pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.